Good evening. On behalf of the governing body of the city of Passaic, we welcome you to the April 10, 2023 city council meeting. In accordance with chapter 231 public laws of 1975, adequate notice of this meeting was provided by resolution of the municipal council adopted on June 21st, 2022, setting forth the schedule of regular meetings for the year 2022-2023. Said notice was published and posted on the city hall bulletin board by the office of the city clerk. Please be further advised due to COVID-19, this meeting will be in-person and virtual stream via Zoom. Public notice and instructions for this meeting were published in the Herald News and were posted on March 22, 2023 on the City of Passaic website, www.cityofpassaic.com, Council Agendas. Instructions are also available on the last page of this agenda. Please be guided accordingly. Roll call, please. Councilman Love? Present. Councilman Mello? Present. Councilman Shorts? President. Councilman Garcia President. and Council President Scheer. President Scheer, we all please rise. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for allowing us to meet this evening. Lord, we put before you, Lord, this governing body and the agenda set before us, and we ask you to please guide us in every decision that will take place this evening. In your beloved name we pray. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Good evening, everyone, uh, both here at City Hall as well as at home. Um, as you may be aware, if you do not have a copy of tonight's agenda and you would like to see the agenda, you can access the city's website where you will be able to uh, see not only the proceedings, but you can also see all the resolutions communications, ordinances of the council will be uh, reviewing. Um, all of the material that you can find online, by the way, uh, is exactly the same material that was provided to members of the city council a few days ago for their review. We're pleased to have a presentation tonight, a proclamation uh, from our mayor. Mayor Laura, would you like to Help us with the uh, presentation and uh, your mayoral update would be most appreciated as well, sir. Yes. Today we'll do a proclamation regarding child abuse. This was a request from the Passaic County CASA Court appointed special advocates for children who are abused or neglected. They recruit, screen, train, and supervise volunteer advocates to ensure children in the child welfare court system are safe and receiving the services that they need. CASA advocates to help siblings find permanent homes together to help a child access needed services to uncovering information that helps reunite loving families. Through CASA services, children are more likely to have access to appropriate services, have a higher level of education, and a higher rate of adoption. They are committed to serving children until they are safe and have a permanent and loving home. This not-for-profit organization was founded on July 2, 2007. Since its founding, they have grown from one single staff member and five volunteers to 22 staff members and 151 volunteers. In 2022, they served 317 children. They started with practically nothing, not even a computer or a desk or even a pen and pencil. They have survived and thrived through the recent pandemic and one major office flood and construction project and several natural disasters. In the almost 16 years, they have been supervised, or they have supervised 440 CASA volunteers and advocated for over a thousand children. CASA has now grown into a community of volunteers, staff, interns, donors, and board members. I have recently recalled personally working with CASA and uh, running their superhero run at Garen Mountain in order to raise funds to help children. And this April is Child Abuse Prevention Month, and they have requested a proclamation, which I will read into the record. Whereas children are vital to our city's future success, prosperity, and quality of life, and whereas child abuse and neglect 
is a community responsibility affecting both the current and future quality of life of our community. And whereas all members of our community have a role to play in strengthening families to ensure children grow up in a safe, nurturing environment, free from fear, abuse, and neglect. Whereas all children deserve to have safe, stable, nurturing, and healthy home and communities that foster their well-being. And whereas there are almost 300 children in Saint County who enter the child welfare system due to abuse and or neglect each year. And whereas some of those children reside in Passaic, and whereas for the last 15 years, Passaic County Council for Children has provided court-appointed volunteer advocates for children throughout Passaic County, including in the borough, who have been removed from home due to abuse and or neglect, whereas Passaic County Council for Children requires the generosity of community volunteers to step up and serve as court-appointed special advocates for each of these children. Now, therefore, be it resolved, as mayor, along with the city council of the city of Passaic, we call upon all citizens, community agencies, faith-based groups, medical facilities, elected leaders and businesses to increase their participation in their efforts to support children who have been abused and or neglected and placed into foster care. Be it further resolved, that as mayor of the city of Passaic, along with the Passaic city council, we support Passaic County Casa's mission and proclaim April, 2023 as child abuse Prevention Month. With this stated, during the pandemic, Council President, members of the City Council, that come to the attention of my administration that many of the issues and concerns that existed pre-pandemic were only exacerbated by the extenuating circumstances that resulted from the pandemic. Children, unfortunately, being left with uh, supervision that was available, not always ideal. Some parents uh, who were already dealing with addiction now have an even greater access to substances that they would abuse and having children at home for many children. Mm -hmm. The time in school was their only escape. And this was lost during remote learning. This is not an assessment or even a judgment on the approach of remote learning, but rather a statement of a fact, a reality that occurred. And this is why it becomes so important, paramount, that our municipality, government officials, and leaders band together to support organizations like CASA that have committed themselves to support children, to advocate on behalf of those who may have a voice, but may not know how to use it, and cannot articulate for themselves, especially in these most desperate circumstances. So as mayor, I take this opportunity to commend, to thank, to express my deepest appreciation to CASA, to the representatives here, and to join with my colleagues in saying that this month we use to highlight, to educate, to make others aware that every day is an opportunity for us to make a difference and to help children in need. Thank you very much to the representatives of CASA. They can come up to receive the proclamation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I do want to thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, and the council members for recognizing CASA and the work we do in Passaic County. Um, as mentioned in the uh, resolution, over 300 children enter the child welfare system each year, and we just want to make sure we have uh, advocates who are willing to just get in and make sure every child has a voice and that their needs are met. We, we really appreciate it. We're always looking for new volunteer advocates to um, join our team and join in the fight and advocating for all the children in Passaic County. So again, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. We really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> On behalf of the council, thank you so much, not only for being here, but more importantly for being here. Uh, to serve those children most in need. Appreciate it very much.
Thank you. Mayor, can we turn to you for uh, an update? Sure. There's another proclamation that we'll just uh, speak briefly on. It is titled 2023 You Drive, You Text, You Pay. It speaks to distracted driving and it being a serious life threatening practice that is preventable. Distracted driving can result in injuries and deaths to all road users, motorists, pedestrians, and bicyclists. And distracted driving occurs when drivers divert their attention away from the task of driving to focus on another activity instead. There were over 32,000 deaths that came as a direct result of distracted driving with the convenience of smart devices, with how intuitive they are, easily used and uh, managed while multitasking. It is often attempting to respond to a call, to check a video, to read a message while driving. I personally am reminded each time I am tempted that just because I can doesn't mean I should. Uh, often, and I share uh, facetiously, I know it's not a, an exact uh, example, maybe a flawed analogy, but I used to go to a barber. I used to cut my hair while he was on the phone while smoking a cigarette. No, my barber is not a city council member. <laughs> I get one a meeting, one a meeting yes. I get. Yes. You said it. And uh, at the same time, at the same I time, what talking about. at the <laughs> same time, he would joke around with others. And I, at times I would, I would go, you, you're very talented. You're really good at multitasking. However, I wish you wouldn't when you have a razor in your hand. <laughs> This is funny and we can laugh at it, but when it comes to driving, there are many of us that feel that we can do so much and still do it effectively. And this proclamation is to remind us that it only takes a split second to make a mistake that we can't come back from, to rob a mother of a child or someone of their significant other. So I would add, though, I, I think it's very catchy. You drive, you text, you pay. I would add, it could wait. Simple. It could wait. And if it can't, pull over. With that stated, Council President, this uh, season, or rather these few weeks, become uh, very important to so many members of our diverse and beautiful community. Our Muslim community, which is observing Ramadan, going through a time of fasting, coming together in the evening with families, to enjoy dinners and times of reflection and prayer. We wish them a blessed time of fasting. Members of our uh, Orthodox Jewish community and those who observe the Passover are spending time uh, in a sense separated from the world on specific days uh, with family, with friends, and observing their faith and expression of their religious beliefs. We wish them the most blessed pass over so many members of our communities that observe the Christian faith. Recently celebrated Palm Sunday, uh, referred to in Spanish as Holy Friday, in English Good Friday, and uh, Easter Resurrection Sunday. As a city, we facilitate and celebrate our diversity and the need to express uh, these beliefs and these practices and the respect for our freedoms given to us, for the, to each and every one of us through the Constitution and our laws here, uh, both in the state and in the city of Passaic. Our city streets were used for processions. Mr. President, there were four processions. I would like to acknowledge the four churches, Holy Trinity on Hope Avenue, one of the biggest processions in the history of Passaic. There was also one uh, at Fatima that uh, partnered and is now together with St. Nicholas. The procession began on Exchange Street. Exchange Street came down uh, Paseca Ave, past City Hall. They stopped at City Hall and prayed for all of the council members, government, police, fire, it was a beautiful thing. And then there was one that took place at St. Anthony's Apollo off of Oak Street and Myrtle Avenue. And that one took place um, starting from there and went around St. Anthony's School. And then there was one at St. Mary's Church, um, Rowan Market. 
for different wards, some all um, around the same times together, the same block of time. I want to thank our state police department for their hard work. Chief Guzman, thank you. Um, I want to thank uh, Deputy Chief Gentile, who was present for each of the processions. He said he got his, all his steps in. But that was amazing. Uh, I think, uh, um, obviously, uh, Lieutenant Burnett who did a great job uh, leading the traffic and all of the uh, officers that were there for all of the processions. Um, they are so extremely important to our communities. Many of our streets get blocked off, but it becomes so important to the children of our community. At the burning of uh, the bread, for the Jewish community, there was uh, over 2,000 people easily at any given moment that you can count uh, together in our parks, which was a blessing for our community. I want to thank Deputy Chief uh, Shea that was present along with uh, our police officers, um, especially Officer Greg Tedorenda, because at one point in the mass, you can only see him because he's about six foot five. So he's the only one that we can identify. He's like six ten, right? But I, you know, everyone is six five to me. I don't know if it's whether he's six five. For sure. But the reason I pointed out is because there was at a certain point such a beautiful sight of children and families. Someone said, where are the police? I said, they're in the crowd. But he could only see one Greg is six foot ten. So he stood out, but that was beautiful. Uh, I also want to point out that just this Sunday, our parks were full of colors right there by the Bullhouse as our uh, South Asian Indian community celebrated uh, Holly or Holy. And uh, there were colors everywhere. Our parks were used for our Indian community, our South Asian community, uh, blocked off. I want to thank um, my counterpart in the city of Clifton, Mayor uh, <coughs> Rabowski, who showed up with Councilwoman Lauren Murphy. And they celebrated the holiday along with our South Asian community and others right there in our park. Why I highlight these in our updates? It's because whether it is those who celebrate the Hindu religion, those who are Muslim, Christian, Jewish, those who have other faiths or no faiths, our city opens our arms to all communities, wherever we can, practically, legally and appropriately, we make our parks, our streets, our facilities available. We are here to support every community. And it is such a privilege to witness how this great and wonderful diverse community continues to grow. And the smiles on children's faces as they join with their parents and celebrate what is so dear and sacred to their families, but also as they walk by and see other families of other communities celebrating, not exactly in the same way as they do, but with the same support and similar joy, similar bonding, unity, and love. That is the very boss of our community. I wanted to share that. Um, an update regarding today, our firefighters. I don't see you. <laughs> I'm glad that you can see me. I see you. Thank you for sharing that. Hey, we have, didn't we? Um, I'm sorry, Council President. Is there, uh, I, I, the gentleman who's speaking, the, this is the uh, mayor's the section of the agenda. This is my update. I'm glad that we see each other now that we have identified and established that John Cena is not here. We can both see each other. John Cena. Okay. Anyway, okay. you got it. Thank you. Thank you for getting that to <laughs> I got it. <laughs> anyway, as I was saying, and I'll go back to uh, finish this particular update, our firefighters closed off Broadway and had the ladder on top of a business um, right in the middle of Broadway, closing off uh, Gregory Avenue and then closing off uh, Grove Street. And for about a half hour, our firefighters were on ladders, climbing on roofs, all to rescue a cat. Someone called and said there was a cat stuck in the sign. We witnessed this live, and I just wanted to share that the firefighters, they, there was no end to their creativity, Council President. I'm glad because the cat got stuck inside of a sign, and had it been left there, that could have been a catastrophe. <laughs> so sorry. Oh, oh, my God. God. But this they were able... <laughs> To nip that situation, or rather, catnip but, that situation. Oh anyway, is there a doctor in the room? <laughs> Please turn it off. 
police are with us. They, they weren't able to rescue the cat. One of the residents in the area took the cat and said, I, I want to take the cat. You know, I, I had shared we wanted to make sure the cat was safe and okay, we bring it to the animal shelter. But the resident uh, was able to connect with the cat and bring the cat home. It was a stray cat. And I just wanted to take this opportunity to highlight our firefighters and our police officers that were there, uh, helping, holding the ladders and bringing them in. Sometimes our officers and our firefighters, they don't respond to uh, just fires and emergencies. They're there to help our community, whether it's assisting a senior citizen. Sometimes they're crossing a senior citizen across the street in a high traffic area. Sometimes they're helping a kid find their lost dog or they got separated from their mom at the fair. Sometimes they're climbing up ladders and going on roofs trying to find a cat or a parrot. In some cases, a chinchilla. We can talk about that in the future. Oh I'll share with you some of my <laughs> It has occurred. But with that said, our amazing and remarkable police and fire department, they work so hard every single day. That today was a, a good day. It was a day we're smiling about and laughing about when, uh, when the firefighter was coming back down with the cat and everyone was surrounding the firefighter with phones, I think half expecting the cat to respond with, uh, <laughs> with a thank you or something. But it was very kind of them. Uh, Council President, coming up, we have an autism awareness event an autism awareness event that will occur April 15th at our Christopher Columbus Park, 380 Paulson Avenue, by school number 11. It will be from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. It will be run by the Mayor's Youth Council and Passaic Recreation. We are very excited about this and we will share the registration for all to sign up online. All of our flyers for upcoming events can be found at the City Hall website, as well as the City Hall social media website on Facebook. That is the official site for you to follow on social media. The mayor's site is not the official site. That's where you get all the corny jokes. You don't want to go there. Also, we will have a dog and cats free rabies vaccine clinic appropriate to today's rescue with the stray cat. It will be located at Armory Memorial Dog Park, our dog park right on Main Avenue on Saturday, April 15th from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. You can get your rabies shot for your pet. Also, we want to let you know that baseball and softball clinic specials will begin Saturday, May 6th. This Saturday, we will uh, start <laughs> signing people up. But Saturday, May 6th, if there is a rain day, it will be May 7th, Sunday. Parents or guardians must remain on site for the entire clinic. I'll reiterate that. Parents must, this is not a drop off and date. <laughs> Right, for the parents, please, somebody must be designated to stay with the chain of curves. Uh, Councilwoman, don't laugh. The parents just leave their kids and say we'll be back later. On uh, April 20th, partnering with our assemblymen of the 36th Legislative District, Thursday, April 20th, we will have New Jersey Motor Vehicle, New Jersey Motor Vehicle, which will come here to City Hall on William Street parking lot. And you will be able to do your driver's license, non-driver identification cards, registrations, real ID license plates, credit cards, and examination permits. Lastly, on a serious note, and I'll conclude with these, but um, allow me once again to acknowledge and, and highlight the leadership of our assemblyman of the 36th Legislative District and our Council President Gary Scher, who is instrumental in reaching out to the state agencies that they would provide resources and assistance to our community in person. It's not always easy to make it to these state agencies. And even when you make it there, it's not always convenient, especially for those who have to work and have to get back by a certain time and stay online for more periods of time. So we thank our assemblyman who is serving today as our council president for his work and leadership in this area, as well as many other agencies that come from a serious um, no resources are serious. Council President, this week we had uh, a shooting that occurred at school number 11. It impacted three uh, individuals, two adults and one youth. It was at 7 p.m. It happened in an instant and our police responded afterwards. There were many individuals on the scene. I was present on the scene that evening. 
I chose purposely not to go live because there was an active investigation and there was information that was sensitive at the time, but I was present on the scene to see the reaction of our police, the reaction of uh, the county in response. And prior to that, a few weeks ago, there was a shooting that occurred on Monroe Street. It is of concern. It is of concern as all of the measures that we take we cannot always prevent incidents from occurring or individuals coming from other areas to commit crime in our city. I want to take this opportunity to commend the work of the Pacific detectives. They made an important arrest of individuals who utilized guns on the road street and arrested these individuals. They are in custody in the hands of the prosecutor. Three individuals are police work diligent. Over the years, our violent crime stats have gone down. Every year, we have seen a decline in violent crime. Last year, our police were able to take 40 guns off of the street. Guns from the hands of those that came from other municipalities. Guns from those that came with intent to do harm in our city. This year alone, we've taken 17 guns out of the hands of criminals. It is much harder today I would propose to you to be a police officer. There are many more restrictions. It's much more difficult in terms of stops, in terms of searches, in terms of interactions. Our police are required to be smarter, required to be more patient, at times expected to be counselor, lawyer, parent, priest, and everything else in between. So kudos to our police officers for their hard work Kudos to the leadership of the Pacific Police Department. Over the years, we have consistently seen not just violent crimes go down, murders, and also thefts. At one point, while stats, and I don't usually do this, and I won't go into detail, but when juxtaposed with other municipalities, and their stats were going up, the city of Pacific was going down. That is a direct result of remarkable police officers and the leadership of our police department committed every single day. It is unfortunate that incidents occur. I would wish as mayor that no incident occurs. Much like when you hear on the news when there's a plane crash, the news only covers the plane crash. So people say it's not safe to fly without realizing every single day thousands of planes take off and land with no problem. Every single day individuals go to parks, play with no issues. Every single day, people walk the streets, they're safe and they're outside. When an incident occurs, it gets covered over and over, and people say it's not safe. I know we will never, ever create a situation where there won't be any incidents. And some may even come and say, well, how can an incident occur next to a police substation? Much like saying, how could a fire occur next to a firehouse? How could Sin occur next to a house of worship. How could any of these things occur? We can't prevent every incident. There are many that were prevented because individuals were present, because there was substation. We've seen these approaches work because the stats have shown they have declined. But never did this council or my administration promise that through any initiative, some miraculous act or panacea solution was created where there would never be issues. We will continue to work hard vigilantly to, uh, to create a community that is safe and welcoming for all. I know it's not the same. But there are times when you'll find trash next to the trash can and not in the trash can. There are times where the light will work and yet people will still run them and there will be accidents to share that in 2022 and this year we haven't had a single fatality as a result of a vehicle accident. We have implemented many traffic initiatives including angled parking where people have said you have to drive so slow down these streets we don't like it but since we've implemented them in these high traffic areas we haven't had a single fatality. Those are verifiable statistics that get reported to the state. These initiatives work but it doesn't mean that we will never have a fatality. There's no excuse for leaving the city unsafe. And I can tell you with 100% accuracy, 
confidence that our police are doing everything that they can to keep our city safe. From walking details, from assigning police officers to specialized units, with all the resources we have available, we are doing everything that we can. With 3.2 square miles, there will be times that the police will be on one side of the city and a call will come from another. Rarely will the police receive a call stating in five minutes I'm about to be robbed. <laughs> Or 10 minutes from now, someone will shoot you. If we receive those calls, I would propose to you we would have less incidents. More times than not, the calls come in, I was robbed. Or there was a shooting, and the police respond. I know that's common sense, but since people aren't privy to it, they ask the question, where were the police? The police were doing their job. And when an incident occurs, they go to the scene where the incident occurred, they don't go to where they think the people are running to. They all run to Route 21 after an incident. They may miss out on saving a life or checking on those that were the victims of these incidents. I simply share this because without perspective, sometimes people may make statements. And the impression is given that our police are doing everything that they can. I wish the news or Facebook or others would cover every instant that a police officer stopped the crime, prevented a potential crime, every single incident where an officer arrested an individual, mm -hmm. took a gun off the street. Those don't make news. I don't blame journalists. I don't blame those who cover it. I get it. That gets more attention. Those who post on Facebook will get much more rights for saying, the police can not do anything. Then saying, I see them all the time. With that stated, I won't say we're on phase, rather we continue in our resolve. But the coverage is good, and the coverage is negative. We continue doing everything that we can to keep a safe community, but we need everyone working together. Because if we can work together, it is not just that we desire to hold those who commit crimes accountable and bring them to justice, which we want to do that, but also we want to provide an opportunity for young people to turn from the wrong path and get on the right path, to take advantage of our many recreation opportunities, and job training opportunities, and programs that have been expanded through the leadership of this city council, as well as assist those who wish to join the re-entry programs and become productive members of society to get a job. We have hired many individuals to our departments of public works and other agencies, given second chances, third chances, and even fourth chances. It's not perfect. I assure you this is a good city. I'm very proud to be the mayor of it. I'm very proud to work with these individuals, these city council members who care so very much for its development the expansion of programs, preservation of parks, and committed to a vision for the future of our children. Thank you so very much. And that will conclude my presentation for this evening. Mr. Mayor, thank you very, very much. Um, your remarks were, as always, insightful and, and, and inspiring. With the council's permission, we are on room six of our agenda, minutes of the January 10 and January 24 meeting. Are there any changes, additions, or corrections that need to be noted in terms of approval? Seeing no lights, is there a motion please to accept? So moved. January 10 and January 24th, there is a move and a second. Councilman Monk? Yes. Councilman Love? Yes. Councilman Mello? Yes. Councilman Short? Yes. Councilman Garcia? Yes. And Council President Shea? Yes, thank you. We're on hearing of citizens. In accordance with the Open Public Meetings Act, NJSA 10 colon 4 1 at SEC, the Council opens every public meeting for comments of the public. However, in accordance with NJSA 10 colon 4 12, nothing in this Act shall be construed to limit the discretion of a public body to permit, prohibit, or regulate the Act, the participation at any meeting. Therefore, the City Council will not entertain comments from persons who communicate obscene material, make statements which are considered bias intimidation, in which any person attempts to intimidate any individual or group because, uh, 
group because of race, color, religion, handicap, sexual orientation, or ethnicity, or makes personally offensive or abusive, defamatory or profane comments, comments intending to harass or speak any offensive or abusive language, the person who makes these statements will relinquish their allotted five minutes for public discussion. Uh, we invite uh, comments from the public at this time. If you would like to uh, join with us with any questions or concerns that you have, if we could please ask that you call 929-436-2866. That's 929-436-2866. And enter the meeting ID number 898-9261. Two three four one. That's eight nine eight nine two six one two three four one. And please press asterisk nine to indicate that you would like to speak. Again, those numbers nine two nine four three six two eight six six. Meeting ID number eight nine eight nine two six one two three four one star nine. Madam Clerk, do we have anyone on the wire? Yes, we have Mr. Wolf, I believe. Mr. Wolf. Mr. Wolf. Mr. Wolf, are you there? Good evening, Council President. Good evening. Um, I wanted to ask about Resolution 23 tonight. Um, there's a resolution that the City of Passaic is going to possibly allocate up to $3 million, uh, $3 million for a low income project on right off Broadway at 312 Broadway. Um, about this project, just a couple, just, just maybe six weeks ago, um, it seemed to be coming for first reading to be designated as a redevelopment zone. And Prior to that, this property was actually for sale, noting that it has approvals for, for multifamily. And only a couple of weeks later, the city's talking about, you know, allocating 2.8, the, the, like almost, it seems like almost the entire sum that they have for such projects for this project. Now, I'm sure Mr. Fernandez is going to say that it's up to that amount and you know it's going to be negotiated and you know based on what is needed over the 15 year period that they're allowed to use funds but when this came before the city council for redevelopment was it mentioned at all that this is going to be a low income housing project it seems that the city commissioner knew about it and at a public hearing there was not even a single mention of what type of project this is gonna be. I mean, a low income, 70% low income housing is something that could affect the neighborhood. It could put a very big toll on a lot of resources for a city in the, in the, in the, low, in, uh, in the low income projects that the city, the city housing authority currently manages. It's told that many, many of the calls and many of the patrols of the police department are taking place right right over there. Does this, you know, the city is not a very strong financial city in terms of, um, in terms of re revenue from rateables. We, we rely on a lot of state funding. And are we really looking for such a project? But even if we are looking for it, why was it not mentioned at all at, at, a, city, at, 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 at a public hearing where the city council was being asked if they want to designate this area as a, as a redevelopment zone. That's my question. Okay, thank you for your question. Mr. Fernandez, can you give us some background, some history on this item? And if you could also speak a bit, if you wouldn't mind, sir, on the American Rescue Fund's design for projects like this and only this. Okay, so, um, the plan, the redevelopment plan that this council approved um, always included a portion for affordable housing as well as workforce housing. The mayor has made it very clear uh, of his intentions and vision to include both affordable and workforce housings for individuals in our community, as diverse as it is uh, in its culture as well as in its 
income. So that was always in the redevelopment plan that was approved. Secondly, this is a. If I can President, you, if I, may, I think we have the same question. Let me let you say it. I think we. Mayor, I defer to you, please. Sir. If you can distinguish or help people understand the difference between workforce and affordable, just so they know the difference, mm -hmm. Council President, was that along the lines? That was one part. And the second part, if you could, uh, Mr. Fernandez, if you could address the issue of legality. And that is requirements that have been given to us by the courts, by higher bodies than ours, in terms of requirements to be in compliance with the law. Yes. Um, so the affordable housing is anywhere between 80% uh, of median income uh, and below, right? So there's moderate and there's low. And then there's workforce housing, which is between 60% up to 120% of median income in our region. And that is all based on statistics that are provided to us by the federal government on what that is in our region. And based on that, uh, individuals have to qualify based on their incomes. So there's a wide range for workforce housing. Those are the, the gap that the mayor is constantly talking about of our individuals that are working, uh, but can never get, you know, they make, too much for affordable, but, but too little for market rate, and this would meet that gap. Uh, and then you have your affordable. In this case, this is actually um, a unique type of funding, so it's not your typical federal uh, home funds. These are American Rescue Plan funds, uh, which were allocated to the city of Passaic. Uh, this was vetted by the Housing and Urban Development HUD. And uh, some of the requirements for this funding is that it limits uh, the type of individuals, it's not just income based, it's also, uh, it's also, I don't know what the appropriate word is, but uh, based on individuals that are um, victims of domestic abuse, uh, about to be homeless, you know, so the program, this money was specifically set up under the American Rescue Plan to protect those individuals um, that are victims as well as uh, trying to avoid them from being off the street and if they find themselves on the street have a, a place to go. So that's why this is uh, a little different than what the council is typically seeing. The regulations are very clear. The usage of this money had to be approved and allocated before the end of the year. If not, the city of Passaic would lose the money. It would not be able to help these individuals. Uh, the number of units was actually after our, our community development department, our community development director, Ronald Van Rensselaer, met with HUD and uh, our consultant, our community development outside consultant vetted uh, the process and the amounts and got it all approved uh, from uh, the uh, housing and urban development. I hope that answered the question. I don't think I missed anything. Did I? How many units are we speaking about, Mr. Fernandez? So this is a 20% set aside like is typical in most affordable housing complex. So this is not 100% affordable. Uh, it's roughly anywhere around, let's say 50 to 60 units with about uh, 10 or 11 that'll be affordable. But what uh, the council needs to know is this is just to allocate the, the money for the project. They still have to go before the planning board for the site plan to get approved. So I can't sit here today and tell you, oh, it's gonna be 50 units, it's gonna be 60 units. Uh, that'll be part of the planning, the normal planning process that goes uh, before the planning board. So everything follows a, a certain process? Absolutely, multiple processes. Is, is there a requirement by law that affordable housing be built? Uh, there is in the state of New Jersey under the Fair Housing Act of the state of New Jersey. Every municipality in the state of New Jersey has to provide their fair share of affordable housing. In fact, uh, something that the mayor has been very direct on is the diversification of incomes within our projects to not concentrate any one uh, income level to create continue that diversity. And um, if it wasn't clear before, opportunities like this funding don't really come often. And uh, if we don't use it, it would we would lose it. Council President, if I may, even even or along those lines, there is. A requirement and expectation for municipalities to provide affordable housing, but also it is against the law to prevent the development that is legally and ethically available when all requirements are met of affordable housing. I, I only state that because, and I know that sometimes questions are asked and they're important so that we can make sure to clarify and they're beneficial to all that the city of Passaic cannot 
in any way deny a project because there's an expectation that individuals that may live in a development may attract uh, more resources because of perception. Now, when it's practical, if someone says, well, if you're going to have a lot of cars, that's going to take up a lot of parking. That is appropriate. The individual perceives that individuals who have workforce housing and, uh, and don't make as much money as perhaps uh, others may require more resources. We can't base our decisions on that legally. We base our decisions on whether or not a project is viable, whether everything is done ethically. And I just want to reiterate what the business administrator stated, and I think this is extremely important, is this allocation, if it is not used for a project like this, we don't get to redirect it somewhere else. It's not that we keep that money. That money is lost. It goes back. It may go somewhere else. That money was given with the intention of a project such as this, something unique. When the, when the business administrator mentions individuals that may become homeless, and this would be correct, this could also apply to senior citizens on fixed incomes. Mm -hmm. Because of the pandemic, because of circumstances, extenuating or otherwise, may not be able to find apartments. I think sometimes when individuals hear affordable housing, they assume, um, or let me not assume what other people assume, that would be bad. Uh, but it can be considered um, a concern that you're gonna have individuals who cannot pay rent. That's why workforce housing, if you consider 20% um, set aside of its 10 units, and this council in its wisdom, along with working with my administration says, we wanna push for workforce housing. These are individuals that have jobs, that that can't afford to pay rent, that are working, but because of the market, sometimes in extenuating circumstances, they have some challenges, so they may not be able to afford, and I'll throw out arbitrary numbers, uh, an apartment of two bedrooms for 2,800, but they probably could 2,100. So because there are uh, restrictions on certain income and assistance programs, so let's say someone who has subsidized rental assistance, they they may not be able to get more than 1600 at all. But a workforce affordable unit may be available for someone who makes 2100 they have a job, and this becomes beneficial. It may be a senior. Either way, we meet the expectations, requirements from the federal government, the state government. It helps us with good government practices. They look favorably, favorably upon our city and it opens up for additional resources and funding in the future. This is why we take approaches like this. I wanted to give, I guess, a little bit of a bigger picture. Was, was that consistent? Yes. Good job. Uh, is there anyone else on the one, Madam Clerk? Not on the Zoom. We have Mr. Kamasani. Yes, sir. Yes, good evening. Joe Conesenti, 170 Broadway. My first question, Council President, is the intersection on how and Paulson Avenue study was supposedly be done. Hasn't, I don't know if it's been done or not. Um, but that intersection is very dangerous. You got crossing guard close to be getting hit. You got cars running through the lights. Um, at the school time, you need that no no turn on red. It could, it could save a lot of lives because that's a very bad intersection because you got school 11, you got the high school, and you got school four. You got all these students going by. And these cars just don't care. They just come out in the road and go through the uh, red lights, making those turns, and it's very dangerous. This is Howard and Paulson? Howard and Paulson, yes. Um, in legal vendors, I noticed that there have been officers out there, but as soon as they chase them, these people come back again. It's getting to be out of control. They're selling turtles, which in New Jersey, turtles are illegal to be sold. I don't know if you know that. You got like different vendors, you got jewelry vendors, you got you got all mixed vendors out here. You got these people with these shopping carts selling food. Who knows where they're making it? Who knows where, you know, where it comes from? 
the property at 147 and 149 Broadway. We had officers there uh, last week, but the squatters came back again. They set up their uh, homemade tents and they're still living there. It's not but a sewer. The owner should be fined. I don't know what the issue is, what the holdup is, but if that was anybody else, it would be fined. I don't know why they're getting away with this property. Something has to be done about the two outdoor dinings that we have. The one on the corner of Central and Lexington, those, the dining areas are terrible. They're eyesores, they're a wreck, they're dangerous. The one at, the one at 663, um, Mama Sushi over there, that's the worst place. Anybody drives by from out of town and they look at that, there's nobody gonna sit in that dining area. You got those uh, vines, the dead vines. There's nothing, nothing to uh, make you wanna sit there and eat. It's horrible. You know, the safe supposed to be getting better and it seems like it's getting worse. My next one is uh, officers maybe need more equipment. They need more support and more where they can do their job instead of told not to do their job. Like in other words, we had the shootings in the past three weeks. The one on Madison, um, the one on Monroe Street. And you had the other one after that was on um, Madison and Gregory, all gang related. Nothing to be hidden about it. This is all gang related. Future shootings, a guy got killed and now they get uh, retaliation. You know, um, you had the drugstore right across the street, had a hold of Then you had the, um, then we have these dirt bikes. You're supposed to do a study. I mean, what kind of study can you do for dirt bikes? Give the okay to the police department and they get the vans and they pick these bikes up. They clean up the vendors too. And I don't know what you're waiting for. What's going on here? These are my questions I have. It's time to let them do their job. So forgive me, Mr. Consente. Are you suggesting that these officers are being told not to do their job? That's what it seems like. No, no, no. You got I, the dirt no, bikes, I, I, I wasn't asking what up? your perception was. You made a statement that yeah. officers are being told not to do their job. It seems that way. Yes. Well, Mr. Gunnarsson, I thank you for your remarks today. I'm going to uh, see if there's anyone else who would like to speak. That oh, suggestion is questions, offensive. Right yeah, no, and it's being offensive. turned right back to you, sir. Anyone else like to Next adjust the council? Sorry about that. There's a motion to close second. public Motion and second to close public hearing. Councilman Monk? Yes. Councilman Love? Yes. Councilman Mello? Yes. Councilman Schwartz? Yes. Councilman Garcia? Yes. And Council President Shea? Yes, thank you. We're on the agenda, ladies and gentlemen, under Roman numeral nine. I'm sorry, eight. Ordinances for second and final reading. Number one, please. Proposed ordinance 2391-23, an ordinance amending city ordinance 2377-23, which authorized municipal nonpartisan early voting in the city of Passaic to correct Scrivener's error contained therein. Is there a motion, please, to open public? Move. Move and second to open public discussion. Councilman Monk? Yes. Councilman Love? Yes. Councilman Mello? Yes. Councilman Schwartz? Yes. Councilman Garcia? Yes. And Council President Shear? Yes, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, the Council is contemplating proposed Ordinance 2391-23. Is there anyone who would like to speak now regarding the ordinance and the ordinance only? If you are not here with us this evening, let me give again the call in information. 929 Four three six two eight six six, and to the meeting ID number eight nine eight nine two six one two three four one, and press star nine. 
Anyone on, Madam Clerk? No, sir. Is there a motion, please, to close? Mr. Yeah. Conasani at the today. Yeah. Joe Conasani, 170 Broadway. Yes, sir. Um, what is this referring to? This early voting. It refers to voting prior to election day. Madam Clerk, can you share with us early voting? Um, the council chambers will be available that Friday, Saturday, and Sunday before the election for voters to come in and vote in person here in this building. And do you know offhand, ma'am, what the hours are? Um, it's 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. on Friday and Saturday and till 6 p.m. on Sunday. And that's anyone who is registered to vote in the city of Passaic or anyone at all? Anyone in the city of Passaic. So you must have a re you must be a voter in Passaic? Yes, sir. So, yes, Mr. Mayor? Well, we've got a little while to go before we get there. Thank you. That, that's an important clarification. Thank you, Madam Clerk, for as always being on top of this. So my question is, why do you not vote by mail if you haven't this? Vote by mail is for That's your early people voting. who would like to vote by mail. This was not a decision that was made by this council, but rather by the legislature and of the state and the governor. So I would suggest you contact your local representative. But aren't you part of that as the assembly? I'm sorry? Aren't you part of that as the assembly? For all intents and purposes, yes, but I'm in a kind of a double role here. Tonight I'm in the role of a council so you member. Put that, you put that on the governor's agenda? Well, I trust I that right? you'll be in contact with them, and this is not on the ordinance, Mr. Condescent. Yeah, okay. Did we close public hearing? No, sir, not yet. Is there a motion, please, to close public hearing? So moved. Second. Councilman Monk? Yes. Councilman Love? Yes. Councilman Mello? Yes. Councilman Schwartz? Yes. Councilman Garcia? Yes. And Council President Shear? Yes, thank you. On the ordinance, is there a maker, please? Move it. Second. Second. Councilman Monk? Yes. Councilman Love? Yes. Councilman Mello? Yes. Councilman Short? Yes. Councilman Garcia? Yes. And Council President Shea? Yes, thank you. Communications, Roman numeral nine on our agenda, items two, three, four, and five. If we could please have a vote on four only. Is there a motion to accept four only, please? Move. Second. Motion and second on four only. Councilman Monk? Yes. Councilman Love? Abstention. Councilwoman Mello? Yes. Councilman Short? Yes. Councilman Garcia? Yes. And Council President Shear? Yes, thank you. On items two, three, and, <coughs> two, three, and five, is there a, are there any questions? Seeing none, is there a motion to accept? Second. Motion to accept and second. Roll call, please. Councilman Monk? Yes. Councilman Love? Yes. Councilman Mello? Yes. Councilman Short? Yes. Councilman Garcia? Yes. And Council President Shear? Yes, thank you. All matters listed here are considered routine in nature. Items 6 through 15. Are there any questions, please, from the council on 6 through 15? Seeing no lights at this time, is there a motion, please, to accept 6 through 15? Well, second. Motion and second. Roll call. Councilman Monk? Yes. Councilman Love? Yes. Councilman Mello? Yes. Councilman Short? Yes. Councilman Garcia? Yes. And Council President Shear? Yes, thank you. We're on resolutions now, Roman numeral 10. Uh, number 16 is a resolution authorizing closed executive session. Susie, do we need closed executive? We do not, Council President. Very good. Thank you. Mr. Fernandez? No, Council President. Mr. Mayor, sir? None at this time. Thank you, sir. Uh, members of the Council, why don't we set aside 16, please, on items 17 through 40. Are there any questions, please, on 17 through 40? Councilman Monk. Yeah, thank you, Council President. Um, let's start with item uh, 36. It's a resolution uh, to reject, actually, a proposal for conceptual design report at cost estimate for local flood hazard mitigation analysis planning for the NJ transit underpass. So, uh, is there any way that there'll be any responsibility? I'm New Jersey Transit, being that this is their overpass. And the second question, really more of a comment, um, I don't know if, there's, if there is a way, but um, 
other municipalities, you see the New Jersey Transit, they put a lot of money into a train station to modernize it. And um, our train station, it's nice to have an historic site in, in town, but uh, you use a little help. In fact, even like the steps going up and down that lead to this underpass also in need of, of uh, repair. So just more of a, I guess this opens up just the discussion of the whole area. Uh, is there any way to compel New Jersey Transit to give some attention to Passaic? Mr. Fernandez. Um, so the first question is on the underpass. So portions that are um, required by them to maintain, they would need to maintain. The other portions that are ours is ours. That's why we had to bid that. It's up. Yeah. Yep. Oh, there it is. We're back on council business. Mine says an unknown. We are on to the public. Yes. We apologize for. Uh, Misfunction of our systems. Please uh, continue, Mr. Fernandez. Uh, so I believe where we got cut off was there was a, a major allocation to the bus terminal, a uh, new relocation of the bus terminal. Uh, the mayor and I were in several meetings with them about what the way that was going to look. Uh, we had discussions about an urban transit hub where the state of New Jersey is actually uh, assisting the city free of charge with. Uh, just technical assistance so that we can uh, open up additional funding sources to upgrade the train station, other bus uh, terminals and things of that nature uh, within the city. So we are looking into that, but, you know, they focused their money. I, again, we can tell them, uh, but they decided that that was a more critical for their infrastructure was to do the bus terminal. So they went there first, I guess. And, and I'm sorry, how much money are they giving for the bus terminal? So it started with $4 million, but after our meeting, Mayor, right, it seemed like it was more than, it was like closer to five than four uh, when, we, when right. we had our last meeting with them. And most residents from the city going to work, coming home from work, use buses, use trains, use... So the, the busing, this is what our understanding of what they reported to us was the busing system that has the highest ridership. In fact, that Passaic Ave, Passaic Street Corridor is one of their busiest uh, busing lines that they have within the entire county. So. so it'd be nice to have a glorious train station also, but in terms of prioritization, it would seem to me that the immediate priority as now and has been and, and will soon be answered uh, through the mayor and his good work is, is getting that bus depot going. That's correct. Mary, did I misstate anything? I just want to make sure. That yes, I, I would just add uh, to the council president that um, Councilman Monk's uh, question regarding is there a way that we can compel um, New Jersey Transit? I believe that one of the commissioners on the county serves as the chair of the NJTPA, which is uh, Commissioner John Bartlett. If we could perhaps reach out to him on behalf of Councilman Monk, if, if the councilman would choose and through the council president to ask if he would be willing to be present at a meeting or perhaps a separate meeting with the council members just to update. I know uh, some of in, in your role in the state, but as well as council president, you have worked closely with Commissioner Bartlett. He would not be opposed to having an opportunity to share his knowledge and information I think we could entice him with a few empanadas, but he would love to come here and uh, share. But I, I think it would be important to hear from the council. If the council president uh, would be open to it through the council, we can uh, send an invitation, Mr. Administrator. 
and in his role he could come by to one of our meetings. So, a, what, a council meeting? I'll leave that to the council okay. president. To no, perhaps we can invite the commissioner to come to the meeting and, and uh, share with us, uh, hopefully, in-depth brief remarks. <laughs> that would help councilman because he, he sits directly on the board. I think he chairs it this year and he could hear some of the Great. concerns directly. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, on item 23, I had just some questions on 23. Um, just to understand how these funds are used. How are the how is this allocated towards um, the eleven units? That was the funds. How is that calculated? How much that the developer should receive towards? So that's statutory. So the when the when that came out, HUD has a, a dollar amount for the type of unit. So if it's a one bedroom, it's X dollars. If it's two bedrooms, it's X dollars. If it's three bedrooms, it's is x dollars so mm -hmm. depending on that uh, mix and by the way the push is to have families this isn't just for single individuals they want hud is pushing and throughout the state of new jersey and kind of the council president alluded to it uh was they want families this is not just for you know sole individuals uh so my understanding is hud is allocating for two and three bedrooms which are in the range of anywhere between 230 to 280 per unit, depending on the bedroom size. And that's the stat, That's the formula within the statute. Right. right. So, right. So I, I, I question. Just so I'm trying to understand the logic behind the two and three bedrooms, because if you look at the list of that qualifies under this program, the quality, they call it the qualifying population, population. Mm -hmm. right? Uh, what comes up there is homeless or risk of homeless, mm -hmm. uh, fleeing or attempting to flee domestic violence, right. dating violence, sexual assault. Um, then you have other populations requiring services or housing assistance to prevent homelessness. Um, so again, I, again, I don't know, I'm just thinking what I would believe, if I could be totally wrong, that typical typical homeless person was going to be an individual. And but these funds, there, 70, Councilman, if I can interrupt you, I, I'm not quite sure statistically if that's the case. I, I well, said I, I don't think know. It's a great I, question. I don't know. I don't know. I said I don't know. No, it's, and, it's and, a great question, Council. If I may, perhaps it would explain why there seems to be a little bit of an urgency from certain officials to utilize the funds now as opposed to any other time. One of the results of the pandemic is that many families that otherwise would not have fallen into that criteria of almost homeless now qualify. Families that before no one would have considered to have been potential homeless, I mean, we hear people say, by the grace of God, or any of us could be homeless. But because so many people suffered financial hardship as a result of the pandemic, they now qualify. Those qualifications are soon coming to an end by order of the President of the United States of America with the end of the pandemic. I believe that time is coming in August. It's this summer. That there's an official designation that the pandemic and criteria that were provided in the pandemic will be done. So we're getting the workforce families and individuals that typically you would go, okay, a teacher and let's say an individual that was working in a hospital that was laid off or an individual who because schools closed, <coughs> because their company closed down, they're now eligible to be in this category. They can receive the assistance in these homes. That's not going to be the same. So I, I definitely understand what you're saying, but that's why it's so I'm not going to say important because that's subjective. That's people's perception. I, th I think that's one of the motivating factors behind trying to ensure that we don't lose these funds now because in the future, the city may not be as open to a project if the categories are that restrictive again. But right now, they're very open. Does that make I, I sense? Yeah, yeah. I was just questioning why the, that these funds are two and three bedrooms yeah. while they're trying to... Uh, the it seems like the common thread through this uh, qualifying population is more of a homeless fits under that box of yeah. being homeless. It's definitely not going to be a, a homeless shelter 
or a homeless uh, program. This is actually more for those that were what we often refer to as devastated or adversely impacted mm -hmm. uh, because of whatever extenuating circumstances resulted, the pandemic, the market, and they now qualify. And if the money is allocated, then the opportunities are opened up for them to apply for the development to be made, mm -hmm. but it will not be a homeless program. Yeah. Okay, I, I just a uh, few of the points if I may. Sure. Um, it, it seems if you break down the amount of funds that they're receiving, um, and you look at the total cost of the project, you pretty much it seems like they're pretty much getting paid for the full cost of those 11 units. Okay, but um, if you look at the rent schedule, I would have a little bit surprised. I would have thought that if they're getting if they're receiving funds for this total project, that um, they have very little overhead, right? They're not paying a mortgage, right? Typically, on the rest of the project, they're borrowing, let's say, 60, 65% of the cost is the cost of the mortgage, right? On these 11 units, there's zero cost to them, overhead, in terms of debt to cover the project. And in the meantime, you look at the difference in rents to projecting a, um, Let's take a um, a three bedroom a three bedroom. I'm trying to start a heart. A two bedroom. Oh, okay, let's take a two bedroom. Two bedroom, one bath. That's not on the program. Is seventeen hundred dollars, and a two bedroom, one bath is a similar size. Under the under, under the program is around fourteen hundred dollars. So, my my point I'm making is that. I understand these these programs are out to help the homeless, right? To help that, that sector. But at the same time, it looks like it's totally weighted in a way to benefit the developer in a in a much more of a on the higher end. That's I, I would say because they're only losing based on their underwriters. They're only losing I said from seventeen to fourteen hundred. It's three hundred dollars. They're only losing losing around twenty percent of the rent, but their overhead is zero. There's no mortgage on that piece of that apartment. I would have liked to. I would have hoped to have seen that these funds go into a project that they should they shouldn't get a hundred percent of the funding. The funding should get sixty seventy percent of the funding. At least let the mortgage cover the balance and get more than eleven units. Get stretch these funds out. That instead of in a project like this, instead of getting 11 units, we should be getting 16 or 17 units. And at least we don't have to make the developers rich over this program. They should be making at least the same thing. So I, I would I just it's a little bit uh, surprised, a little bit disheartened to see this type of formula uh, these funds go to such a program. Excellent point, Councilman. Mm -hmm. Excellent point. Would you like me to? Please. Uh, typically, that's what we. Typically, on a, on a normal home program, as this council has been aware, and the mayor's pitched this since day one, it's to stretch them out because those are funds that we get annually, and they go to our first-time home buyer program, they go to our rehab program, and then they go into the development program. So we try to stretch them out. This is, and I think the mayor said it best, this is a very unique, specific moment. This was vetted through HUD. So not only did our outside consultants have to vet this HUD, to grab the project, and vetted it for this purpose. Another thing that uh, you may see that there's less of a gap between the rentals, which by the way are dictated by HUD, not by the city or the developer. Those rents are dictated by HUD, was that workhouse component. So normally when you're looking at a two bedroom or three bedroom in the city of Passaic, and I know the mayor is gonna back me up on this because we get the calls all day long, especially him, they're over $2,000, but the discussions and the negotiations were that you make that workforce housing component, don't put in the rentals, because you can, but you know very well, it could have been a much greater gap because a two bedroom, you could get it for 2,100, which yes, the mayor was talking about, 28. sometimes 2,800. 20. Uh, and the discussion was, let's diversify the portfolio because we may not have this chance again. I, I got you, but I'm just saying that, that I would think again that the idea of these programs is not to make developers. I'm not against people making money. You know, it's great, 
but to use funds to help the homeless, to help the sector, I would love to see this money being spread out and make a developer take a mortgage on that piece as well. He's making their very decent rents. You know, they're not they're not giving it away. They're not giving these two or three bedrooms away for cheap for free. So that's purposeful. Yeah, you know, but I believe that, it's purposeful because again, this area wouldn't be conducive. This project wouldn't be conducive to a homeless program or to individuals that are homeless. We have programs like that in the city where we create a resource center. What we're looking at right now, and again, I think it was mentioned the extenuating circumstances that resulted in providing the opportunity to use these funds and not lose them, meet some of the expectations for affordable housing that our city is facing, while at the same time ensuring that those who are working or perhaps seniors on a fixed income that can afford a home but may have found themselves in a position that now they qualify or classified as potentially homeless, it fits. In terms of the developers, we need to set the formula. I think the <laughs> set that, he shared that. We would change it. I think this council would change it. Does it benefit the developers? Yes, we, we have no control. When, when it's put out to the public for anyone who responds, whatever developer responds, they get the benefit. Yeah. We can go to HUD and tell HUD, HUD, we think you've given them a great deal. Maybe you could have given less of a deal and it would have spread out. I think we've all experienced that frustration. We have no control over how the state does, but what we do have control in terms of uh, communication, that went out for anyone to respond to in the public. We don't get to pick and choose who responds to it, and then the formula is already set. So once it's out publicly, the person responds, the formula, they get their benefit. Our goal is to try to support or even present projects that fit. This project seems to fit for this time. I would tell you as mayor, I would be confident saying I wouldn't have seen this project fit four years ago. I wouldn't be able to confidently say I think a project like this would fit without the requirements that are before us or some of the lesson restrictions five years from now. It just seemed to fit now and rather than have the money be taken away, it seems that there was a project that made sense. And how, and how are these funds advertised? for people to know that they're out there to, you know, take advantage of them? Uh, so how does a specific um, posting guideline, I mean, specifically where we put it, I defer to the community development department, but what I can assure you is that they follow every HUD requirement and we had to send the, the, the posting to HUD. They had to approve it before it went uh, and so it goes in a paper. I think there's 30 days. What, what rings a bell is it goes in a paper uh, 30 days prior to today. Uh, any individual that wants to propose a project can propose the project. Uh, is our that, community development director on uh, Mr. Ron Van Rantzler? Uh, <clears throat> yes, Mayor, I'm here. I thought it was RVR. Um, through the council president, if the... Um, if the community development director can respond to the question as to how was this advertised or if it was advertised publicly. Councilman, uh, yet, uh, would you mind sharing with the uh, director? Uh, yes, there was a 30-day comment period that's required from HUD uh, that uh, we complied with. Uh, and residents uh, had opportunity to review the plans uh, and give input as well as to uh, what their thoughts may be with regard to um, how we allocated the funding. I, I believe, sir, the question was really, uh, what is the process? Do you add your name into a, a fishbowl? Is it done, is each application gone through first? We, we um, are only required to advertise that the city has received these funds for a period of 30 days in our local newspaper uh, to give residents in the community uh, that time uh, to review uh, the funding and give comments. It's a 30 day comment period. Do, do I need to be a resident of the city of Passaic to qualify for one of these units? Yes, you do. Councilman Monk? Yes, so. So in other words, when the city receives these funds, the city advertises that the city has these funds available 
and then anyone can put in an application. I can't hear Is you. Clear? Pardon me? I can't hear. When the city receives these the home this home American the city, when the city receives home American rescue funds, the city advertised that we have three twenty million dollars available and anyone has the right to put in an application for these funds. Is that how it works? Uh, that's basically how it works. Good. But that's that comes after that comes after the 30 day comment period. The 30 day comment period is specific to the amount of funds that we received and what the city's plans for those fundings are and what the community's input uh, and to get the community's input as to what they would like to see the funds be used for. If I may, through the council president and the city council, uh, Mr. Van Rensselaer, uh, director of our community development, that public notice, which is put out explaining that there are funds available, that's public for everyone, not just those who are looking for units, but for developers, investors, everyone becomes aware of the public notice that those funds are available. That's correct. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Any uh, questions further for uh, the community development director? Mr. Von Rensselaer, thank you very much for your time. And please excuse uh, our interruption of your evening. Thank you. Councilman Monk, the floor is still yours. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate Thank you, Council President. I'm, I'm done. I'm, 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 I'm. Councilman Schwartz, please. Question uh, number 30. What are we looking for for underwater inspection of the lake? Uh, may I? Please, Mr. Fernandez. Okay. So, this is actually required by FEMA. Uh, in order to cover any repairs in that area. So for example, uh, in Hughes Lake, we have the dam. We have to get one of these inspections done so that we can then add to FEMA so that we can get funding for any repairs we do there. Similarly to, excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, similarly to the uh, outlets, that go into the river, things of that nature, whenever we're, there's an issue and FEMA needs, we need to get money from FEMA to repair it. Without this, we would not be able to apply for the funds. And I assume none of these issues were documented when we did the dredging and when we had the lake emptied? Yeah, so we did those reports, but if you recall, then we had the issue with the hurricane and the large majority got destroyed as we were going down, especially around that, there was like a manhole that was, uh, I mean, gushing, remember, Mayor? It was like, so uh, there's a whole new set of reports, whole new set of FEMA individuals, and once again, so okay. yeah, yes and yes. How's that? Okay, okay, thank you. I have two lights on, I'm sorry. Who has lights on? Yes. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. Then I have a question. Councilman Miller. Yes, uh, my question is on item 23. So are the, <clears throat> are the residents able to, anyone that's interested, able to apply for this um, currently, or this is gonna be in the future? No, so so what happens, remember, this is, this is the it's preliminary, preliminary allocation. Okay. Then it has to go to the planning board mm -hmm. for the overall project, which includes the market rate, workforce housing, and then the 11 affordable, right? Uh, once that's done and we know the size of units, how many units, and that's all said and done, then at that point, uh, you know, and the developer starts working at it, then I, I remember the last time, and, and Mayor, correct me if I'm wrong, I think you even did like the, the group of individuals and we pulled out like a lottery for individuals that qualify. <laughs> Okay. 
Okay, what advertisement like do we use? So again, we're required by law because okay. HUD is very specific yes. under fair housing. Uh, and there has to be a multitude of media outlets. Uh, it can't just be on social media. It has to be in the paper for those that don't have social media. Uh, because remember the intent of HUD uh, in the requirement, as well as the direction of the mayor is right, get as many people as possible to apply that normally wouldn't apply because this qualifying population as Council Mung was talking about, uh, you know, has to be, we had to get to them in different areas. In fact, some of the discussions we were having with community development was also the county for domestic abuse yes. and things of that nature. So because of the, the qualifying population, there'll be a multitude of outlets that we are required to reach out to for uh, applicants. And that's why there's 30 days to ensure that these reaches put it out and took it back down. They insist on that it's left for a length of time between people reasonable expectation that they will have access to it or use receipt information later on in the future. What the business administrator continues to stress, and I think it's extremely important and very excited about this, these are HUD requirements. Yes. Mm -hmm. HUD has had meetings with us, like ours, and appropriately so. That if any of the criteria is not met, we are responsible for telling you for any allocation that are going to give it out. If I if the council and you ask their questions, it is with this in mind. When the county government insists in that there's a new requirement, it is because if in any way we circumvent any of the galleries or the requirements, we're responsible for those funds. We become very serious to these public notice that it is a fair process that we cannot in any way compromise, alter, or, or interfere with the process. Okay. No, um, I really like this program because household insecurity is, is real right now. Um, I mean, I see it every day. How many, um, how many, you know, single parents are facing household insecurities, and with this, this will give them an opportunity to not fall under that homelessness category. So, thank you. This is really thank you for your information. Are there any additional questions, please, on items 17 through 40? Seeing no lights at this time, is there a motion, please, to accept 17 through 40? So moved. Second. Motion and second. Roll call, please. Councilman Monk? Yes. Councilman Love? Yes. Councilwoman Mello? Yes. Councilman Schwartz? Yes. Councilman Garcia? Yes. And Council President Scheer? Yes, thank you. We're up to Roman numeral 11 of our uh, agenda. Ordinances for first reading. Public hearing is required by law. 41, please. An ordinance amending the City of Passaic's towing and storage fee schedule ordinance. Is there a motion to accept for a set down at our meeting of April 27th? So moved. Motion? Second. And second. Roll call, please. Councilman Monk? Yes. Councilman Love? Yes. Councilman Mello? Yes. Councilman Short? Yes. Councilman Garcia? Yes. And Council President Scheer? Yes, thank you. Number 42, please. A proposed ordinance amending Chapter 29 Land Development Procedures, Article 6, Payment in lieu of Parking, Section 29-56.2, PIP fees for off-track parking improvements of the code of the City of Passaic, New Jersey, to include electric vehicle parking spaces. Is there a motion, please, to accept for set down for second and final reading at our meeting scheduled for April 27? Motion, please. So moved. Thank you. Motion and second. Thank you. Roll call. Councilman Monk? Yes. Councilman Love? Yes. Councilwoman Mello? Yes. Councilman Short? Yes. Councilman Garcia? Yes. And Council President Scheer? Yes, thank you. Uh, number 43, please. Proposed ordinance amending the designation of restricted parking for disabled persons by New Jersey license plate number. Is there a motion, please, to put down for second and final reading at our meeting scheduled for April 27th? So moved. Second. Motion and second. Roll call. Councilman Monk? Yes. Councilman Love? Yes. Councilwoman Mello? Yes. Councilman Short? Yes. Councilman Garcia? Yes. And Council President Scheer? Yes, thank you very much. Payment of bills. Are there any questions on the bills, please? 
Seeing no questions at this time, is there a motion please to accept the bills as presented by the clerk? So moved. Motion second. and second. Roll call, please. Councilman Monk? Yes. Councilman Love? Yes. Councilwoman Mello? Yes. Councilman Short? Yes. Councilman Garcia? Yes. And Council President Shea? Yes, thank you very much. Mr. Fernandez, Administrator's Report. None at this time, sir. Very good. Mr. Mayor, sir. Council President, I wanted to update the council. The project that many are seeing going on on Brook Ave and Main Avenue, the additional parking that is being created that we're so excited about. I wanted to point to 3rd Street in Passaic by 143rd Street. An almost identical project has been completed and striped. The parking that was provided with land that wasn't being used in a very densely populated area in proximity to our Pulaski Park uh, through an application process that we made. Additional parking was made, dividers were removed, and a uh, parking lot was created and expanded uh, parking opportunities in two areas that were conducive to join and make one big parking lot for the residents. That is 3rd Street downtown. In a matter of months, we will begin on the work of the parking lot across from Pulaski Park, a brand new parking lot right between Dundee Island and Pulaski Park. I wanna thank this council because as we committed to the community together to have expansion of parking development and parking opportunities, that is being realized every single day in every ward. A benefit to the residents in proximity to our parks. And with the parking deck that's coming across from City Hall, and initiatives that have passed through the city council and applications that have been approved through the state are our different uh, relationships and our abilities to uh, work through uh, the bureaucracy of government from the county to the state level through beneficial representation. And our cooperative efforts have resulted in thousands of new parking opportunities for our residents over the years. And that's something that we can be very proud of. And then lastly, if I may, as a point of privilege, Council President, if I may just uh, ask a question. Um, Mail-in ballots. Mail-in ballots usually go to those who are homebound. And sometimes they cannot make it out in person. So they receive ballots and they fill them out. And oftentimes they can leave it for the mailman who can pick them up and take them back. To the best of my knowledge, early voting doesn't result in someone who is homebound that cannot walk and somehow now being able to be mobile and come to City Hall, if, if I'm correct, for mm -hmm. those individuals. So mail-in ballots are a benefit to some in terms of convenience, but a necessity to some people who cannot leave their homes so they can either receive the ballot from home, fill it out, sometimes have a loved one, take it to the post office once it's filled out and sealed. I share that because I believe that a statement was made and I'm often um, concerned that once a statement is put out there and people see it online, they may not know. Early voting has nothing to do with uh, the existence of mail-in ballots. Mail-in ballots are encouraging individuals to vote early, but also a necessity for some who cannot leave their homes. Uh, sometimes that could be seniors. Sometimes there are those that are bound to their home because of temporary uh, ailments or because of uh, long-term disability or permanent disability. So I wanted to share that, that any resource or tool that provides opportunities to residents to uh, engage in this most sacred act of, uh, or civic duty that we refer to, this uh, democratic right that everyone has in our form of government to vote and to have their voices heard, is a positive. This council is voting to make it more accessible for people to vote. I personally recall a time where people questioned whether everyone had the same opportunities to vote, whether there were greater opportunities, whether there were restrictions or impediments to vote and whether this was fair. And I wanna commend this council for their support and push to ensure that people get mail-in ballots, early voting opportunities, not just for municipal races, for county races, for state races, to encourage individuals to vote says a lot about the governing body of the municipality, because no one can guarantee that those votes are in favor of those that are making these opportunities right. available. But Wait a second. Yes, <laughs> you didn't know that, it's already too late. It is, it is more than just ethical. I would propose that it is noble 
to say, it doesn't matter how you vote. We want to make sure you have mm -hmm. access to voting. You're that's, able to vote. That's and you can do it as, as early as you may need because we live in a city where some people work two jobs every single day, including the weekend. Mm -hmm. and the idea that we're making it available for someone to go on a Sunday afternoon or a Saturday morning to ensure that their vote can be heard, I applaud the city council for doing this. And I thank you because we tell people all the time, you should vote. Those are words. And what you're doing in this vote is following up your words with actions to help our community. And it is not the first time you fought for early voting in previous elections as well. So thank you very much as mayor. I'm so very proud of this action that you've taken and I wanted our community on the record to hear that. Thank you very much. And to our city clerk, thank you for reminding us and all the hard work that you put in to make sure that we're getting those votes out to the public. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Mr. Thank Mayor. You. Any comments from the council? There being no business publicly advertised as required before this council, is there a motion to adjourn, please? So moved. Motion Thanks. and second roll call to adjourn. Councilman Monk? Yes. Councilman Love? Yes. Councilman Mello? Yes. Councilman Shores? Yes. Councilman Garcia? Yes. Councilman President Shear? Yes, thank you. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you.